Hello, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to our question and answer session today with Professor Jason Leach um, and with Anna Fowley, Chief Executive of SCVO. My name is Beth Nakushi. I lead the support services here at SCVO, which has included our coronavirus information hub, which hopefully many of you have accessed and, and found useful during the pandemic. Um, we're back today by popular demand. So we had a session with, with Jason Leach back in August when we were in a slightly different position. It was uh, phase three of the route map at that point. And we were talking about reopening services uh, face to face in, in ways that were safe. Um, we're obviously in a slightly different position now. We're under our uh, strategic framework, so we're all living under slightly different levels in the country. Uh, we've got some silver linings of the vaccine uh, on the horizon for us, but we've also got the Christmas period to get through. Um, and the knowledge that in our sector that often involves actually more work as we're supporting people who are vulnerable and, and isolated during the festive break. Uh, so we'll be talking today a wee bit about how we can do that in ways that are as safe as possible. Uh, a few housekeeping things. We're recording the session today. Uh, it's a webinar format, so I've invited you into my living room, but unfortunately we can't come and join you guys in your kitchens. Um, but we will encourage you to use the chat box. Um, and so if I can ask you right now just to pop in your name and whereabouts in the country you are, so we can all see one another in chat at least. Um, and if you've got questions that you want to submit, if you use the Q&A button to do that and you can upvote questions that others have asked, then I'll, I'll try and get to them. We also had quite a few questions submitted ahead of time and we've grouped them into broad themes and we'll use those themes to try and answer as many of the, the topics as we can. I think that we said when we last had a session with Professor Leach, if there's questions we don't get to, we'll do our best to find answers for them and, and get in touch with you after the event today. Um, and we'll also be able to kind of edit the video down and make sure our answers are available. So if there are people who couldn't join us today from organisations that you support or work for, um, we'll make those available and please do share them far and wide. So I think that's us in terms of the housekeeping. Nice to see the chats coming through. Nice to have you all with us. We're going to have a couple of quick polls just to get a sense of what sort of levels people are operating under and what sorts of activities you're, you're, you're delivering just now. And then we'll move into the, the session proper. So um, Helen, if you could pop the first poll up, that's great. So if you could just answer for us, which of the protection levels apply to the areas that you're operating in just now? Whereabouts are most of you? So I know some of you probably don't know if you're four or three because we're we're hopefully we're coming out of four on Friday. Those was those of us that are in four just now, but that's good to see. So we have a few people that are level one, um, twenty percent level two, and then the rest of us are in in you know currently four, going to be three soon. Hopefully, that's great. Thank you. Um, and if we could have the next one up, please, Helen. OK, so we're just asking here if you're planning to deliver any kind of emergency aid over the holidays within your organisation. So food, clothes, Christmas presents, shelter, accommodation. OK, and the results I'm seeing are so 65 percent of people are not, but 35 percent are. So that's that's a reasonable proportion of the people that are on the call today. That's fantastic. Thank you. And the final poll. Here we go. So this is just asking, are you clear about where to find the most appropriate guidance to safely deliver your services and activity just now? All of the time, most of the time or none of the time? OK, so we're 66 percent of people are most of the time, thankfully not too many, none of the time. Um, and I think that we probably all recognise that because it's been such a fast changing environment, um, but we'll hopefully do what we can today to move more of you into the all of the time bracket. Lovely. OK, that's great. That was the, the kind of kick off. It's OK, I'll hand over now to Professor Leach just to give us some opening remarks about where we are more, more broadly. Hey, thanks, Beth, and, and thanks for having me back. I don't often get repeat gigs, so it couldn't have been too terrible. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a really interesting day to do this, isn't it? it hopeful at two levels in Scotland, but you'll also hear some caution in my voice as we answer the questions maybe. So the vaccine, I'm not sure you're familiar with this uh, classification of good news, but the vaccine is proper good news. It's proper good news. It really is the light at the end of the tunnel. Now it's not gonna be a smooth path. I, I think there's gonna be some hills to climb uh, on the train that you can see coming towards you, but but it is really, really good news. and I. I if you saw the 90 year old lady in Coventry this morning getting her vaccine delivered by a Filipino nurse who's been in the health service for 20 something years and is now a matron and with her 
the slightly dangly sparkly earrings and her fancy belt. I mean, was there any better symbol of hope for a global pandemic than that single moment? An Irish lady in England getting her vaccine from a Filipino nurse. I thought it was perfect. The one after her, I don't know if, you, if you've seen the BBC today, but the one after her was called William Shakespeare. It was an elderly gentleman who they'd managed to find called William Shakespeare. I, I was slightly disappointed we didn't have Rabbi Burns lined up in, in Ayrshire and Arden for that first injection at half six this morning. So it's a big day. The other hopeful thing about today is that half of Scotland's local authorities are going to come down a level on Friday. So that is also good news. That, though, makes me nervous. It, you won't be surprised to hear. I'm the public health advisor, one of the public health advisors. I'm not the economist. So all, in the round, I think it's the right thing to do at, at Cabinet and the conversations we've had all this week about getting there. I think it's the right thing to do. But it also, I would just sound a note of considerable caution around relaxation and about Christmas in particular. I'm worried about the five-day festive break of our regulations around travel in particular and the bubbles and we can we can talk about that if it comes up but it, in the round today is a good day it, i'm afraid globally there's not much sign of uh, that same hope one and a half million people have now died 62 million people have been infected and the pandemic continues to accelerate in most who regions principally now in the americas uh, the the US is out of control. It had a million cases in five days. Five days to get to a million cases in the last five days and has broken mortality records again. And there are pieces of South America that I'm afraid are in considerable trouble. Uh, Europe does appear to be getting a grip of its second wave and Southeast Asia has had a bit of a blip but is now in control. Australasia has done very well since the very beginning. And Africa is a little bit of a mystery to us. We're not entirely sure what's happening in sub-Saharan Africa because there's not much testing or infrastructure. So, so the news is mixed around the world, but we are not out of the woods is my main headline. So the restrictions, I'm afraid, on distancing and washing your hands and all of these really annoying things that have stuck with us now, I'm afraid we're in them for a little bit longer. So that, that's, my, that's my state of the pandemic. That's great. Thank you very much, Professor Leach. And if I can ask Anna just to say a few words and then if there's anything you want to have a, a quick chat with Jason about before we get into the questions. Yeah, so I'm panicking now because my daughter's just come back from America for Christmas. <laughs> but it's fine, we're all self-isolating. Not, I'm not letting her go anywhere with our Mississippi germs. Um, so I, I suppose I'm, I was reflecting that since we last spoke, um, we're, we're still in that kind of world where everything's changing, but it still feels like we're really stuck in the same place. It's that strange combination of, of standing still and moving really forward. Um, and it does feel like there's a light at the end of the tunnel. But I am also really worried that immediately after Christmas, this will be a huge spike in cases um, and I know there's all the reasons for doing it and I wouldn't want to be making those decisions but that that definitely definitely worries me and I think what we see is that people are still looking for certainty when there is no certainty we're getting closer to that now but we still are in a position where um, there's a real challenge for people like myself who are trying to lead an organization and be calm and assuring and reassuring to people but inside you're still thinking I have no certainty either um, and I think that's that places a bit of fatigue on all of us and we can get a bit a bit weary with with that um, but I think that made me wonder Jason that um, you have been the embodiment over the last few months of a phrase I heard recently which was we've been able to go nowhere but be everywhere and you've kind of been everywhere lots of the time. I can't believe you've even had a holiday. So how do you look after yourself and what kind of self-care do you allow yourself in this situation? Yeah, it's important, Anna, to, to, to stay, I think, grounded in whatever way you choose to be grounded. I mean, that, that, that's different for different people. I, I have a very close family and wife. I, I have a mum and dad who are, are close and a sister. I, I have a faith. I also eat, drink and run every day. And I don't think I could have done this without eating, drinking and running every day. I also sleep a lot. 
So I'm not a four hour a night guy. So if I don't get a decent sleep, I'm in proper trouble. So I learned that when I was a junior surgeon doing a on call and working 40 hours straight. So, so I have been, I, I do know how to manage it. And I think as a trainee surgeon, I was a dentist and then I did oral surgery for years. You do learn your limitations, I think. And that has uh, stood us, some of us in, in good stead. I'm also very careful. I, I, it's relentless. It's absolutely relentless. But I did watch I'm a Celebrity. I mean, I'm a human being. You know, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not 20 hours a day. I, I, I do know how to relax a little bit. And you have to keep that balance, what, whatever that is for you. It might be yoga, it might be running, it might be looking after your kids. I, I honestly don't care what it is. But you've, you've, got to, you've got to do that. And you've got to realize it in other people too. I think, I think there's an element of give and take, of kindness to others. And social media has been my friend because it allows us to communicate, but it's also absolutely horrible. People are unkind, just unkind. There's no other, there's no other way to put it. They see the world through a lens that I don't understand that is selfish and sometimes bitter. And I, I've had to avoid some of that. We've had threats, we've had physical threats, and you, you just have to ignore some of that. But there's also huge amounts of hope. I, uh, Lynn, Lynn, my wife, is a teacher, and she showed a little video to a one of her teacher pals had asked me to do a wee video for the class. And, and uh, I said they were doing a great job and blah, blah, blah. And some wee boy at the back of the class shouted out, oh, that's Nicola's assistant. So there is joy everywhere you look, as well as some, uh, some misery. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you, Jason. As somebody with a three-year-old and a one-year-old, I'm jealous of your sleep, I have to say. Um, <laughs> That's why I have no children, Beth. We all make choices. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yep. Um, okay, so moving into the questions then. So, so the first one, I'm going to go off with the with the vaccine question, because that's obviously the big news today. So this is from Claire from the Scottish Borders and Social Enterprise Chamber, and she's asking, with the vaccine now available, how long will it realistically be before we can return to offices and work together in person again? Yeah, it's a good question and a little bit unanswerable, but here's the sequence of events, at least. So all the vaccine that we get, depending if we get 10,000 doses, which is about what we've got today, or 10 million doses, which is what we need, then we will gradually work our way through the list of the Joint Committee on Vaccination. And that's good. That's an independent group of advisors and ethicists and clinicians, and people who understand the system. And, and they look at the data and they say, right, the big risk factor here is age. It, the, irrespective of disease, e, if you remove everything else, age is the big risk. So let's start with the elderly and work our way down. And in there, when it gets to the right point, we'll also do those who were previously shielding. Well, those, those who are at high risk, the flu list in summary. But we'll work our way from 80 to 50. And when we get to the over 50s, we'll have eradicated 99% of the mortality. Then will move to the rest of the population who are at much lower risk, but they could help transmit the disease, of course, even if they don't get sick themselves. The reality is we think we can do the top of that list in the first few months of next year, but we think that whole list to 50 is going to take us till the summer. And the big dependency is vaccine supply. So we're ready. We can ramp up pretty quickly. We've got infrastructure that will be bumpy, of course. It won't be entirely smooth. You've seen that even in the first 24 hours of this one. But we'll get there. But you just need the vaccine. And further back than that, you need the regulators to approve the vaccines. And as I said at the beginning, you need the vaccine in Yemen and Ethiopia, just like you need the vaccine in Scotland. So there's, there's, there's work to be done on how that will work. Normality will be gradual, not sudden. It won't be everybody wakes up on a Wednesday morning and thinks, yeah, yeah, beauty. We can go back to major events and we can have all our families around. It will be the way we've come in. It will be, I imagine, we will think about giving families back some in-house socialising carefully. Then we will move to do things that are not quite as essential as that. And then we'll allow businesses and offices back, again, not quite as essential as some of the other stuff. So it'll be, it'll be gradual. I can't predict when. I'm hopeful that by Easter, <coughs> excuse me, it'll look different. And by the summer, it'll look a lot more normal, but not quite completely normal. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. 
Um, so the next set of questions we had in were all around kind of the Christmas period. So the first one here, there were a few along the similar train as this. This is from Grant Simmons from the food train. Um, but he was saying, what would your advice be to those who might ignore the regulations over a festive period and risk a spike in infections? This is hard, isn't it? You can you probably, if you've been watching the briefings or any media, you can see all of us struggling with, with this. We don't like it. But we thought it was the... We thought it was the best of a bad set of choices, really, because we wanted to give people some freedom to allow them to make choices by themselves. And it was principally around social, social isolation and loneliness. And I don't need to tell the SEDO about how big of a challenge that is. And your organizations are right up the middle of that. So the, the best way to describe it is my own family. My parents are 79. They're about to be 80. They can manage to cook their Christmas dinner. They'll be perfectly happy in their centrally heated house we'll be able to go around and put presents in their garden and talk to them maybe outside and maybe even go for a walk but i will not be having indoor christmas dinner with them i would love to i would absolutely love to but we're going to postpone that because the vaccine's coming and we'll make a choice about looking after them and having them for another 15 years rather than just for one and i don't know if i've got the virus i don't know if my sister's got the virus and everybody who gets the virus gets surprised when they get the diagnosis so if you can avoid it, then my advice would be to postpone it. However, if my mum was by herself and maybe couldn't make her turkey on her own and couldn't work the iPad and wouldn't be able to play the Christmas quiz in the evening, whether she liked it or not, with her son on Zoom, then I probably would go and have my Christmas dinner with her. So, so there are choices in there. And what we've decided to do is allow people to make those choices for themselves. There isn't a choice about whether to have a massive house party with 30 people in it. That, that's not what we're allowing. We're saying that if you've got people who have been isolated, who haven't seen their grandkids, or try and do that. You don't have to do it for five days, you could do it for one. You don't have to do it with three households, you could do it with two. Just, just be careful. And we do worry that a spike in January, February is probable. And we'll manage that when we get it. The health service will manage it. But if, that's, if, if there are more infections, there is more risk of death. And it's, it's as blunt as that. Yeah, that's great. Um, and then we had another question, which is more about the impact of that um, you know, possible spike on the kind of workforce development. So this is from Margaret McCarthy from Crossroads. Um, and she was saying, as the festive period potentially will have some level of relax and therefore an increase in the risk of COVID spreading, um, do we think there might be a further full lockdown or more areas we move back into level four in January? And she's asking this because of things like the, the adult social care winter preparedness plan, um, care at home staff uh, already trying to manage the risk to the people they support really carefully and how, how to plan for that, that possible workforce um, so, so winter. I think, we'll do, I think we'll do absolutely all we can to avoid a national, another version of a national lockdown. Our, our regional structure, our regional tiers and levels has been deliberately designed to avoid that. So, Unless something goes really wrong and the population go uh, off, off on one, even in Otley and Shetland, then I, I think we may end up in looking at the levels. So we've announced today levels for the country. We're going to do that once more before Christmas. And then the next review will be immediately after Christmas in the first week in January. We won't have seen the Christmas relaxation numbers come through yet. The virus takes longer. So January, mid-January, beginning of February, that would be the time when we might have to think about going backwards a little bit. And that'll depend on behavior. We'll get some early warning of that because we'll know from travel, from early signs of infection rising. So we'll get some indication of that. And we might have to go back, but I don't think we'll go back to a full lockdown, but it will depend entirely on the behavior of every individual. This is the thing about public health versus normal health. What you do affects millions. If you have diabetes, what you do affects you and maybe your family. But now this kind of infectious agent, it means your behavior affects millions across the whole population. That's the big lesson around population health. Great, thanks. So I'm going to move on now to some of the more specific questions about the, the guidance uh, and service delivery. Um, so the first one I think is really the million dollar question. This is from Caroline McGee from Impact Arts. Um, and she says, we deliver youth employability and pre-employability pre services across Scotland. And much of the guidance for youth work says that face-to-face -face delivery should only be considered for those most at need. How do we define most at need? Because you could argue that all of the young people we support 
fit that category. Yeah, so that's a judgment. And the government's not going to make that judgment for you. Half of you would like it to, and half of you would hate it to. So, so we're, we're, stuck, we're stuck in the middle there. It's the same as people shouting at me for saying, don't eat your roast potatoes from the same spoon. And other people saying to me, how should I eat my roast potatoes? I've got half the population wanting minutiae and half the population saying, leave me alone, I'll manage my roast potatoes, thanks, mate. And, and this is not quite the same as that. I'm being flippant to make, to make the point. So, so we do our best to set the framework on which you guys who are in the front line can make those choices. If you think that's an essential service that can't be delivered online and is some form of therapy and is therapy and is helping, then that's, that's a reasonable excuse to have it face to face. If you think you can either do it online, even though it's not quite as good, I understand that, then that's what you should do for another little while. If you think it doesn't meet those criteria, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be doing it. But that's a hard judgment. And I've, I, I think we've got to trust you as the delivery system to be able to do that. I, I know the Glasgow City Mission very well because I've had a connection with it for years through my family and Lynn has volunteered there teaching for, for many years. I, they, they made adjustments to their night shelter at, at, the, at the beginning of the pandemic where they closed it. Now going into this winter, they've, they're going to open their night shelter. They, they've decided how to do that safely. I didn't, I didn't tell them to close it or open it. I set the general framework with the guidance and then the city mission in, in consultation with those they serve and their volunteers have managed to find a place where that is an essential service and will be delivered safely, having made a different choice in February and March. So, so I think organizations are best placed to make those choices. It, the, maybe I could do it with one other example. If you're doing a recreational art class in level four, that, that's not essential. If you're doing art therapy in level three, that, that, that's probably a different thing. That, that sounds to me, if that's with kids with autism or adults with dementia, that sounds to me as though that might be a more essential service. And there's not gonna be a binary choice between those two things. But I, I think you know what therapy and essential is when you look at it. That's great, thanks. Is the, is the four harms something that people could use to help them with that? Is there anything in that that would? Yep, so, so the four harms is the way we nationally look at these choices. And I, and I think it is a helpful lens. It, it, it doesn't, it's not a formula. One of the problems we've had with the, with the tiers and the level system is we announced the data that you needed to be in in order to move through the levels. And that has become a bit of a hostage to fortune because people now look at that bit only and say, well, we're a four. What? I mean, for goodness sake, why are we not moving? Or whatever, in, the, in any direction. And you can, you can cut that data however you like. The reality is the data and the COVID harm is only one piece of the choice. You then have the health service harm from blocking the health service with COVID cases. You have the societal harm from loneliness, from elderly people being locked in their houses, from care homes not having visitors, to economic harm, straight loss of business, unemployment, and all of the misery and public health challenges that unemployment and economic uh, challenges bring. So yes, if you look at them in the round, that should make, help you make better decisions. And that's what the cabinet does. On Sunday afternoon, or Monday afternoon, whichever day, we had a four harms meeting. We have a four harms committee that has health service people on it. It has the chief economist, it has the chief social researcher, and it has the chief executive health service to deal with each of these harms to try and help us make a rounded choice about what should happen to Aberdeenshire and Dumfries and Galloway. Brilliant, thank you. Um, quite a specific one here. So this is from Tracy Groom from Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland. And she was asking, what is the track and trace responsibility in a community venue? So test and protect in Scotland, not track and trace. Track <laughs> and trace is England, so let's be careful. So test and protect, same thing. I'm, I'm, I'm again being facetious. Uh, the test and protect system works independent of anybody else. So anything you do is a bonus. So, so we're not, we're not going to come and get you and shout at you if you haven't done it. But if you think about what test and protect is, it's, it's an attempt to find a positive case and everybody they've been in touch with. That's what we're trying to do. So if that's in your own home, you're going to know. So if they phone me today and say, who have you been with in the last two days? I'll say, well, Mrs. Leach and X or I was at the 
It'd be bad for me because I would have to say I was in the First Minister's office. That wouldn't go well, uh, although we're very distanced. So if I had been at a chest, heart and stroke essential therapy session, I would say that. Or if I'd been at the Glasgow City Mission Shelter volunteering, I would say that. And then Test and Protect would then say, did you know everybody who was there? Well, no, I didn't. There was a fella in the corner. I spoke to him. I gave him a cup of tea. I didn't really know who he was. So, so what they will then do is ask permission to contact that site. It might be a pub. It might be a call center. It might be chest and heart and strokes, chest, heart and strokes offices. So what you would then try and help them with is who was there during the time Jason was there. So keeping a register, keeping a map of the layout, that kind of thing is then helpful to the contact tracers who phone you. And that's, what, that's why you're signing your name at hospitality sites and leaving a contact detail. Test and Protect will only use that if they need it. So the, so the hospitality company will help us with those conversations about what Test and Protect is trying to do. And it's simply to try and find the contacts of the positive case. So if you're in a pub and you've sat in a corner and you're in Aberdeen city centre, who was at the next table? Well, I've no idea. Do you think those tables were maybe closer than two metres? Yeah, they were because they get a one metre allowance. They're allowed to be closer than two metres. Well, if you're positive, I need to find Frank and Mary who were sitting at that table. So the register is the way we would use to do that. That's great, thanks. And I imagine if you're in a community venue, you're going to be having conversations with the management committee and the trustees of that venue, as well as with you as an organisation that's hiring and the venue. Yeah, and yeah. there are some sensitivities in there. I've, I've had a, a number of conversations with addiction counselling services and Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, organisations close to my heart for family reasons. And, and there are some intricacies in there that you, you wouldn't want all of that information shared. You have to get consent. You have to make sure people know that we're not going to hold it for any longer than we have to. We're not going to use it for any other reason. We're simply going to use it to help them to stop putting them at risk of COVID. And usually when you explain that sensibly, if the person running the thing explains it, then people are, people are happy with it. But, you, but you've got to be sensitive to that privacy and that confidentiality. Yeah, great. And I see that Lisa's just popped into the chat, the chat there, the supporting community safely resources that SCDC have developed, which I think is one of the best plain English sort of interpretations of all the guidance for, you know, people that are running activities in the community. So if you if you weren't aware of that, uh, please do take a look at that because it's it's really, really excellent and been developed with SCDC and, and Public Health Scotland together. Um, great. I'm only seeing one question in the Q&A box, so do feel free to ask your questions in real time, people, if you would like to, but I've got a list of plenty here that I can, I can keep moving through. Um, so a very specific one for uh, Rebecca Crawford, who's from Voluntary Action Orkney. So she was asking, she'd be interested in knowing guidance for in-person events and meetings in level one areas. Um, so she's saying in Orkney, we can meet up socially indoors, but does this extend to professional settings? And the context is they've got some consultation activities with the community they'd like to run in the new year. Um, but they think that doing them solely online might mean some people were, were missed out from them. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So Orkney has uh, done well, let's, let's call it, will we? Uh, no blame for anybody who's not doing as well, but Orkney has done well and they've got to level one. And in islands not connected to the mainland of Scotland by road, you can now have people in your houses. And we've just announced that for some other islands today that are in level one areas and Orkney is one of them so you can meet in houses but it's six two so six people two households so it's pretty restrictive and the other guidance still remains extinct so it still exists so we'd ask you to be cautious about other indoor mixing because you're not virus free in Orkney you are virus low but you're not virus free so it could come in and the last thing you want is to spread that to a group of 15 people you happen to be consulting with. So I think at a small scale, if you use 6.2 as a kind of guide, I think that would be possible, particularly if you're doing something that's a little bit of a harder to reach community that you maybe wouldn't do online, that you couldn't reach, I don't know, people with no internet or the elderly who wouldn't be able to use that. Although my mum would, my mum's more IT savvy than me, so she would hate me saying that out loud. But group, groups that find that more tricky or maybe disabled individuals who you'd be better to go visit, then I think that would be acceptable with caution. So still with distancing, still with hand washing, still with all those other things in place. Because I say again, you don't know you haven't got the virus. You think you haven't got the virus. That's a different thing. 
Yeah, absolutely. Great. So I hope that's helpful uh, up in Orkney. Um, I've got one here, um, which is somebody who's asking about, they're concerned about sort of mental health and isolation and worried that actually in, in some areas people are, are doing nothing uh, because they're so concerned or being overcautious. And that's from Alice McCarty from Volunteer Centre East Ayrshire. Um, so have you come across that at all, the sort of people being so scared of doing anything that is actually detrimental? Yeah, I do. I do worry about that. We have worried about it. We've run a lot of TV campaigns about clear your head and loneliness and hotlines. And, but it, it, is, it is really difficult to do that on a national level. That, that needs local befrienders, local community services, even the good morning service. I don't know if you know it, the good morning service that rings people up just with volunteers. And, and asks them how they are that day. And a lot of neighbours have been doing that just as part of their pandemic response. So I've, had, I've had notes through my door from people around me, mostly friendly, no, all friendly, eh, with, with numbers and email addresses, and if we, can we go for your shopping for you? And I think it's that level of care that we need, and I hope we keep some of that kindness as, as we come out of this. And, and we have scared the population for good reason early on, but we've got to balance that with actually sedentary living is not going to help you here. You need to do a little bit of exercise. And we've tried to always allow exercise and outdoor meetings and all of those things as much as we can. And we need SCVO, your member organizations, other local community uh, engagement, things like the walking clubs and all of these other things that exist at a very granular level to, to, to start and help us, particularly with the elderly who have been locked indoors. For a little bit too long they, I, it really hurts me to have to close the cafes in level four cafes are often the the community lifeline in a village or in a town for elderly people more, more than the gp surgery often and provide more therapy than than the health system can and it, it, those are going to reopen on friday yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. The next one, I might uh, bring Anna in for this one, actually. So this has come from Jenny Keenan uh, from Perth and Kinross Voluntary Action. Um, and it reflects a wee bit on the comments you made at the start, Anna. So she's saying, as, as a leader in the third sector, I'm increasingly concerned about the resilience of my team and of individuals across the sector, managing to maintain the levels of support that we're providing. We all went into emergency mode in March and we've barely surfaced for breath since. Um, any advice for those of us worried about the impact of this on our mental health and resilience in the longer term? I think we're probably all feeling a bit like that, aren't we? And it goes back to the, the what Jason said earlier that, I mean, I certainly feel like that. I feel like it was really, really stressful at the beginning, but also uh, there was a lot of adrenaline around because we were just running to, to do something that we'd never really experienced before. So there's a kind of come down after that. And, um, you know, we haven't had, a lot of us haven't taken normal holidays uh, that, we, that we would take, but yeah, I, I would worry. I worry about um, my colleagues in this because you can see people really overworking. And we also have quite a lot of parts of the sector who've not been able to work at all or as much as they, they would have wanted to. So there's that as well. That's another stressful thing and another thing that does that gets you down um, mentally, I think. So I, it's back to that kindness point. I think we have to be kind and we have to remember that everybody's in their own individual situations and do everything we can to support that and encourage the social things. I think we've been quite good at SCVO at uh, having some social events, whether it's the kind of the, the listening party or we've had you know various little films of what people have been doing or encouraging people to chat, chat to each other. And it is online, but actually it's it's fine. It's working and it means you've got that social content because it's certainly for me I would really miss just having a chat with folk when you're making a coffee or spotting that someone maybe needs a bit of a conversation which you can't spot online um, uh, or even yourself saying oh I just need to talk to somebody about this uh, let me have a rant and so I think we need to be mindful of creating those things that would otherwise happen spontaneously and we're getting better at it but that is I don't think that will ever be properly replicated but that's the bit that I miss is that spontaneous kind of support and, and, and social interaction. Yeah, that's great, thanks. I heard something recently where somebody was saying, it's not just that I miss people, I miss the person I am when I'm with them. And that really struck home for me. There's something about actually, you're quite often a different kind of person when you're in the office surrounded by people and you, you don't get to be that person as much over Zoom. Um, another thing, just I can plug, um, SEVO has got a new HR service, if anybody's not aware of it, and we're developing resources around staff wellbeing. Um, so I'll pop some links either in the chat or we'll make them available afterwards. But again, that hopefully is a, another source of support for leaders in the sector. 
Um, a few questions that are coming into the Q&A, so I want to pick some of them up. Um, so I've got one here from Royal Kane saying, Hi Jason, I want to say that the allowing of physical activity for under 18s has been crucial in maintaining a sense of normality and stability for young people. Do you foresee this position changing adversely at all in the coming weeks? I, I really hope not. I don't. We've we've really prioritised it. The three senior clinicians. It wasn't true in all four UK countries, actually. We really pushed for it in Scotland and across the UK, the three of us. And, and we've managed to maintain the under 18s that we have come under a, a lot of pressure and people are unhappy with me, particularly footballers in the, in the amateur game, the, 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 the kind of real amateur game below the, the seven tiers of the SFA's game where we haven't allowed that in tier four and no travel between threes and fours, that's been tough. And that's because of the transmission in older age groups. That, that's the public health uh, rationale for that. But this virus is quite hard to transmit if you're a kid. It's not impossible, but you have to work quite hard with it. And, and it doesn't tend to give serious illness in kids. We have, though, had to restrict horribly the, the fact parents are having to watch or sit back in their cars and all of that is horrible. We, that, that's not normal. Uh, it makes the referee's life a little bit easier, but it's not normal. But so we want to get back to all of that. And, and I, I think it's been crucial to, to send those public health, the physical activity measures. Schools were closed for five months, remember? So, so we've got to be really careful about, about keeping those kids healthy. And I, I think we've done a pretty good job at finding a balance there between prevalence and physical activity. That's great and really, really good to hear. Um, there's a very specific one that's coming from, from Carla Murray here. So she uh, says, I'm working from home like many others. I'm a sole employee and had a positive case in the house and the heating broke on the same day. And they really struggled to get a heating engineer to come out because they had a positive case in the house. But then obviously it was really difficult to keep clean and hygiene and so on with no hot water. Um, so she's just saying, is there anything you could do for anybody else that might find themselves in that scenario? Yeah, that's tough, isn't it? That's a very individualised story and not good. That's a horrible, horrible experience for you. And we have stopped, uh, particularly in high level areas and in positive houses, the, the workmen the go, going in to, to do stuff. Uh, local authorities are a good resource for that. And it's probably where I would have gone next. It might not solve your problem, but I would have thought if that happened to me and I couldn't get anybody to come, I certainly wouldn't repair it myself. That would be preposterous. But uh, I might, I might have gone to a local authority hotline to try and help with some of that. But positive cases in your house is, is really, really awkward for people, and you would have to, you'd have to set up clean paths, green paths. You'd, it, it's not impossible, but it, but it would have to be done very carefully with somebody who, who understood it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And I echo what a horrible situation that must have been. Hopefully it's all, all resolved now. Um, there's one here that I think I'll put to both Anna and Jason, actually, um, from Rami Okasha. I hope I'm pronouncing that properly, Rami, saying, Jason, what can we do as a sector um, to support the national effort and support people who are living with complex and difficult circumstances? And where do we need to stretch our thinking? So that's Rami from the Children's Hospice Movement. So that's, uh, I think... Uh, so, so it, it's a, it, it, it's really, really difficult that one of the things the pandemic has done is it's revealed once again inequalities, of, of course. And the, the best protection against COVID-19 is wealth. It, it is easier to live with a Waitrose delivery in a house in which you can isolate your family with multiple bathrooms than it is without those things. Uh, there isn't any question. And and a job that continues to pay your salary if you are isolating. So, so I, I think it does reveal some of those uh, inequalities around complex and difficult circumstances, chaotic, sometimes not always, chaotic lifestyles in there, and people living with poverty and jobs that are, whether they're the gig economy or they're just poorly paid or whatever. And I think we have to address some of that. I'm, I, I think there will be an opportunity to build better. I didn't come up with that phrase. Somebody else did in another country. And we're going to look at the care sector, for example. Derek Feely is doing a big uh, care sector review. And I think there'll be other elements of building better that, that will help us come out of this. I hope have, no pandemic is good. Pandemics are horrible. But there will be things that we can perhaps learn as we go. 
Great, thanks. And Anna, anything to add on how we should stretch ourselves as a sector? Well, yeah, I think uh, we, stretch, we stretch ourselves as a system, actually, because what's been really visible and even more visible than before during the course of the pandemic is just what a, a range of support the voluntary sector does provide to people in very particular circumstances. Um, and I think that's become much more visible to um, to public bodies, public, uh, particularly local authorities, over the course of the last few months. And I think I would like to hold on to that more collective thinking. And, and for, for, from a sec the sector's perspective, we need to try and promote that and um, promote our own uh, contribution, but also that willingness to work together and to work in partnership um, with other voluntary organisations, but also with uh, statutory organisations as well, so that we think more collectively um, rather than thinking about our own services. Fantastic, thank you. Um, there's a question that's come in in the chat actually from Grant McLean uh, and he's asking is there any particular guidance for outdoor voluntary activity that isn't sport based such as tree planting, litter picking etc? You might have to help me actually Beth. I'm, I, I, I think there is generic guidance for outdoor activity depending on which level you're in. I don't imagine it's as specific as you seek Grant but it will be about meeting up in those smaller groups of 8, 3, 6, 2, depending on what level of the, uh, the route map, the strategic framework you happen to be in, and you should follow that guidance. Remember, outdoors is safer than indoors, small groups safer than large groups, and small numbers of households safer than large numbers of households. So I, I, when we get right down to level one, that's eight, three outdoors. So, so that would be where I would start if I was in a level one area. In a level two area, it's six, it, and as you go up, it's six, two. So, you, you're allowed two households. So I am allowed to go and see my parents. I'm not allowed to go and see them just now because I'm not allowed to leave my level, but quit, leave my local authority. And I live in Glasgow, they live in Lanarkshire. But during the Christmas relaxation, that might be the one thing I do do is I might go see them, but not go indoors. So that's a 6-2 restriction. Yeah, I think that's right. I've certainly not seen any specific guidance for that kind of outdoor voluntary activity, but I know that... Um, People like Paths for All get guidance for their walk leaders who are, who are doing sort of community-based walks. So, so if you've got a you know a national infrastructure body, there might be some guidance there, or you know as you've just outlined, Jason, just follow the the general guidance around distancing. And if you're an or you know a, an organisation that wants to put a, a risk assessment in place to show you've thought it through and that you've made sure that everybody understands the risks, that's probably quite a good thing to do as well. Make sure you're covered. Okay, great. Talking about Paths for All, um, we've got a question from Francis Bain, uh, who's saying the physical activity message from national leaders was really strong and welcome during lockdown, uh, with emerging evidence around being active and supporting immunity and positive response to the vaccine. Are there plans to promote physical activity at a national level again? So there is a, there's a marketing timetable that gets overwhelmed, of course, because you, now we have to do Christmas. We have to, Tomorrow I'm recording something, I think it's the vaccine messages I'm recording tomorrow for TV. So there's, there's a sequence of events. Physical activity will return to that once we have space for it in amongst the mental health one, the parenting one, the, all the other things. And I, and I agree, Francis, that physical activity has to be right up there. One of, the, one of the last visits I went on before lockdown, although it was maybe a few months before, was a Paths for All. I went for the day to a, a Paths for All walk. We met at a community garden center i had a wonderful scone and coffee when it was finished it was a fantastic organization what a terrific thing it does and i met some people at a huge diverse group of the community uh, some elderly some sprightly and and more sprightly than me to be honest some with dogs some with uh, kids with special needs it was really it was really absolutely a terrific a terrific thing to do and i i bet you they are really struggling to get back to that same level of numbers but have found a way through and I look forward to the day when we can have another one of them with 50 people on it and I promise to come. Yeah we bit hope in all of our future eh? Um, we've got one from Hannah McRae here uh, so she's asking she's an indoor group exercise is allowed within level two however would you recommend it for people with long-term commit sorry long-term conditions to come together as a group? Yeah it's, so this is a risk-based judgment so you there's one I'm, I can't give you personal advice about we, we've decided that in level two where the prevalence is quite low that that indoor distanced physical activity is allowed 
in organised environments. So with regulation in place, with hand sanitizer, with all of the other things going on, the room should be ventilated as much as possible. So all of those other things. And I think you have to make that choice for yourself. If you were previously shielding, I would think twice about it. If you're just a bit worried about it, then nobody's forcing you, but it's probably okay. And if, if, you, if you did it in a safe way, if you looked after yourself, get distance from other people, it might be just the very thing for you. But even though it's December and January, there are outdoor versions of that available. Now that might not suit you. That might just be a step too far. But I, I run outside most days just to, to round, kind of round the block and through the park. And there are lots of outdoor classes now on the Blaze football pitch. And along at the end of my road, there's some really steep steps. I am never doing the fitness class that's at the steep steps. But there's, every morning, there's a load of people on those steps. And they're not all 18-year-old footballers, let me tell you. It's a broad demographic. So it, it, there are alternatives available. So I think you should use your own judgment about how you feel. If you're uncomfortable, don't do it. I think if you're comfortable in a level two area, then it's allowed because we've decided it's safe enough. But it's not risk-free. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so changing tack here just a little bit, and I think this is a topic that we picked up when we, when we last spoke with you. Um, and this is from Jenny from uh, Perth and Kinross again. And she's saying, for those of us working with communities where there are barriers to getting information across, for example, language or literacy barriers, it's becoming increasingly challenging to communicate the regulations and the guidance at the pace in which they are changing. Um, are there any helpful ways in your experience to communicate this kind of information? Are there government resources such as translations, which we could be making better use of? So, so my answer, of course, is to give it directly to you, and you, you're really, you guys are really, really good at that. We, we do translate into X number of languages. We try and make our main guidance accessible, as accessible as, prop, as we can. The daily briefings are as accessible as we can make them. The reality is that when you're changing the levels and the reviews every week, that becomes increasingly difficult to keep up with that pace. The, the, the nature of the question and answer that we do either in the parliament when it's the FM or if it's me in the media on call K or some other radio Orkney or whatever, that, that gets more difficult to keep up with that. Of course it does. And we rely on grassroots organizations, forgive the shorthand, to, to help us with some of that. We, we do translate into every, everything we can possibly imagine. The high level stuff on the ground further in, health literacy helps us a little bit, some of that work. And then, we rely on voluntary organizations and umbrella organizations such as yours to help us with that. I know that it just came to me, I did a thing with Autism Scotland and, and it's not language translation, it's autism translation and they're wonderful at it. They're really, really good at, at, at diagrams and pictures and pastel shades and all, all of that, all, everything that I, that I wouldn't even know how to do to get that guidance in a, in a shape that helps. Young Scott, again, very good at the translation from from the, the quite dry PDFs that we tend to publish in the government down to TikTok videos that basically say the same thing, but they say it to an audience that listens to TikTok videos and doesn't watch PDFs. Yeah, that's great. And I mean, I, I suppose from an SCVO point of view, I would say if, if you're aware of resources that people have created, you know, if you let us know about them, we can do our best to amplify and to share them because there's no point in us all duplicating. So if somebody has made a translation of something or Mix just posted in the chat that supporting communities safely is, is in BSL, if we know about resources like that, let's let's tell one another about them. And as much as we're able to help with that, we, we'd be really keen to. So do get in touch. Um, you just muted yourself there. Oh, sorry, was I on mute for that whole time there? Yeah, just oh, that, I'm well, sorry, we heard you, we heard you <laughs> throughout the language translation piece okay. and all that. It was just when you moved to a question, I think. Just when I moved to a question, no bother then. Okay, so from Claire Stevens, um, and she's asking, Jason, how can the third sector play the most useful supportive role in relation to the vaccination programme? Yeah, it's a good question. So remember, just now, we're not quite in mass vaccination. So we don't need all of the things that people are, are offering to us. So we don't need all the football stadia yet or all the conference centers, but we will, we're coming. And, and there will be a version of that once we get 10 million doses, not 10,000 doses. And at that point, we'll need people to help with travel, people to help with leaflets, people to help with getting to the hard to reach communities, particularly those who maybe don't speak English as their first language or the traveling community or 
those who are just a little bit reticent, a bit scared of the virus, and that might be cultural, scared of the vaccine, rather, that might be cultural, and we'll need community organisations to help us with that. So voluntary organisations should stay in touch. I did a thing yesterday with St Andrew's First Aid, and I think they will, they will help with some of that, like they do with travel to the flu vaccine centres. They, they can do that really safely. They know how to do it. They can pick up elderly people. We'll also need help in the care homes and, and other bits. So for now, we're, we, we can manage what we've got using the health and care system because we haven't got much. But when the real uh, vaccination begins in the first quarter of next year, then that's when we may well need uh, more volunteers. Great, thanks. Anna, I don't know if there's anything you want to add on that, anything about that we've been hearing? Uh, no, I would just sort of re reiterate that, that we would be very happy to help, um, in it, whether it's in just getting information out or getting a call to action. I, I, I saw our counterbody, uh, our sister body in Wales was getting involved in helping the Welsh Government with that. And if there's anything that we can do to help, we will absolutely do that. We've got a lovely building in the, the bottom of Broughton Street that's lovely and spacious. <laughs> but I do think that, that, yeah, with any of that, and particularly awareness raising, getting people involved when you need it, or indeed the yeah. opposite, when you want to say, well, that's enough just now, can you can you calm down? Um, we're very happy to do what we can to support that. Great. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. I think then we've, we've just five minutes left and I think we've got through the majority of the, the questions that came in. If there's anything burning, please do pop it in the Q&A. But I think we've covered all of the, the big themes that were there. So I wondered if just before we close up, I could just go to, to Jason and I'd ask them for, you know, one or two bits that you'd like to, pieces of advice or, or other bits of information to give people just before we head into the, the Christmas break and, and all of the festivities, stroke risks that that... So that's so thank, thanks, Beth, and thank you everybody for your questions. I hope that's been helpful at some level to, to, to get some clarity. I'm sorry I, I don't have all the answers because not all the answers are known. The, I, I think I would finish with hope and, and thanks. I, I don't think you can, you can manage a pandemic in Scotland without this organisation and all of the organisations around it helping. I mean, you, you imagine a pandemic without volunteers. I mean, it would be much worse much, much worse. So, so ju just if you just think of, of homeless organizations and physical activity organizations, never mind everything else, that, that then you get into the organizations that have helped with learning disability or with art therapy or what, what, by listing, you always miss people out. So I'm, I'm hugely grateful and I, don't, I, I genuinely think that you've, you've been an essential part of, of that pandemic response and I'm hugely grateful. There is, there is hope in the future, I promise. The, the vaccine and other therapeutics will help us. Testing will improve. We are gonna get out of this. No pandemic lasts forever. And some pandemics in history have even created a slightly better world when they've disappeared than the one they started with. And I'm hopeful that that might happen for us too. So thank you for having me and thank you for all the work you've been doing. Thank you. I can't. I feel more grinchy than that, but I have to say that I do have a bit of hope, but also I think we really, really need to be cautious over the Christmas period and, and not be daft because we are so near um, our way out of this, um, I think, and everyone has done so well uh, in personally and um, uh, professionally that we let's not spoil it to, to have a party. It's just it's nuts we'll get you know other times will come we'll get back to parties and um, but yeah I would like to say very, thanks very much to Jason for for participating in this and Anne's been so open to answering questions but not just here also just out in life because you have been around so much Jason and I know the aforementioned daughter just back from America listens to you watches you on Twitter and explains to her friends in America what the sensible people are doing so Thank you on her behalf as well. <laughs> thank you, Anna. Great. So thank you again. Um, as Anna said, hugely appreciative of your time today, uh, Jason, and of your time as well, Anna. And even more so appreciative of all your time for joining us, everybody who's here with us. We know it's it's a tough time. We know everybody's weary. Um, delighted to see that we still had 70 people with us on the call today. And we know that this will be shared uh, much more widely once it's made available after the session today. So thank you for giving up your time. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we hope it was useful and we will send on the links and further information to everybody at the end of the call. So thank you so much.